It's good to be back in our church. I give, bring greetings from Mary Lee, and we are so thankful that we are a part of this church. And just a lot of reasons. I think number one is all of you, but I will tell you, uh, I thank the Lord for my pastor. I always say something, but he's here now. Now, usually he's not here, but um, I always say something. I just want to, I just really thank God for pastor's faith. He is a man of faith. Every time I come out to the desert and I see this place, I went like, you know, Lord, it has definitely been of you. But it's also because a man took a step of faith and others followed him and took that step of faith. And Pastor, I, I really mean that. Thanks for never stop trusting God and being a man of faith. And I don't think anyone in this room, not even Terry, knows all the things that are on this guy's plate every day of his life. And uh, I thank you for walking in faith. And one other thing, thanks for not at this point what God has done. It would be so easy, and many pastors do this. They get comfortable. And pastor, thanks for never getting comfortable. I think we're, we're, we, we don't want you to ever coast I can't ever believe this guy will ever coast. But uh, thanks for not being, ever get comfortable. I, I like being a part of a church that's constantly in transition and constantly growing. And I, I really do. And I, I really believe that's why Marilee and I are, are still members here. And really, though, honestly, in the course of the year, for me, maybe not for my wife, but for me, there is no church that I'm in more than Lancaster Baptist. Uh, Marilee attends a good uh, Bible-believing independent Baptist church in Milton, Florida. But uh, this, is, this is where we are members. And we are thankful uh, for that, and I'm thankful for my pastor. Take your Bibles to a great passage. Um, what we need today. Well, let me tell you what we need. We need the grace of God. So take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, one thing that's so great about God's Word is that it is fresh and new. There are many in this room that have heard messages on 2 Corinthians 12. There are many in this room that could stand and quote some of the verses we're gonna read. There are the majority of us are very familiar with this passage of scripture. But aren't you glad that we have a book that is divine, that is alive, that we can go to the scriptures today and get something out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, no matter how many times we've been in it. If you were in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 yesterday, you can get something from it today. And I'm thankful for the Bible being like that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're gonna look at verses seven through 10. Would you stand for the reading of this incredible passage of scripture? Paul is being extremely transparent about events that have occurred in his life and that very possibly in his body or out of his body, he went to heaven for a while. He saw things that no other man has seen on earth and uh, the Lord had to keep him kind of humble because of that. And notice with me, if you would, at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number seven. And lest... I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Boy, God knows how to keep us humble, I'll tell you. The messenger of Satan. That means God allowed it. Satan did it. And what did he do to buffet me? That is a powerful word to actually punch in the face. It's the Greek word that's used when Jesus was beaten uh, by those Roman soldiers. The messenger of Satan to punch me in the face, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Well, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. I asked God, God, this is killing me. This is just beating me up. 
Satan is doing this to me. I asked him three times. And he said unto me, my, everyone together, what's the next word? Is sufficient for thee. We don't need to be delivered from affliction. We need to have his grace in affliction. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, I do this. Because you know what I've learned? For when I am weak, then am I everyone together. What a passage. Father, there is nothing that we need greater in our lives than your grace. We need it every moment of our lives. Lord, may we understand what it is today. May we be greatly encouraged because of what it is today. Father, may we see how to get it today. And you know, Lord, today, may we even understand a little bit why you give it to us. Obviously, since it's grace, it's undeserving, so we sure can't say, oh, we're living pretty good. Father, we are just thankful that you give us this grace for anything we're going through. You know, I was thinking, there's some people in this room that really need your grace. No, Father, every one of us needs your grace. And so, Lord, I pray today it would be a great encouragement, but we will also stay in the position to receive that grace and humility. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts today. I pray this in Jesus' name. And God's needy people said, Amen. Amen. This was very true when I was younger. Once in a while, I still do it. But coming from a broken home and not having an example, I love my dad, never was bitter at my dad, got to lead my dad to the Lord. But coming from a broken home, never had an example of what a husband should be and definitely never had an example of what a father should be. So obviously I observed other couples. And I would ask when I saw good children When I saw couples that really seemed to love each other, obvious question, what's your secret recipe? What do you do? Why is it that you guys get along? Your kids are doing really well. What what, what did you do? I wanna go further with that. When I went to churches and I saw pastors that just really had a touch of God on their hands, I asked them, what's your secret? I want to tell you a little story about him, first time I met him. And uh, when, I was, when I came out to pastor in Santa Maria, and what he said as well. But I, and then people that have been successful in life, I like to ask them, hey, what did you, what'd you do? But I have learned something over the years. It has been very sobering, extremely profound, and very helpful. Do you know the number one answer that people have given me? I remember when I was 20, 21, and I asked these couples, man, why is your marriage good? What's your secret recipe? And they would say, well, we, we do a date night. Well, we resolve conflicts. Well, we jump on things right away. We don't let little things get big. And they would say things. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every couple ever said this. I'm not going to tell you every father I ever talked to said this. But I'm telling you the vast majority said this. They would tell me a little something. And then they would say, honestly, Jim, if there's anything good in our marriage, it's the grace of God. Let let me tell you something, Jim. We did this with our kids. We did this with our kids. But I'm telling you, if our kids love God, that isn't because of their mom and dad. That's the grace of God. Man, I talk to pastors. They say, well, you know, we did this, and we we organized this, and we reached out. We never stopped being a soul-winning church. But can I tell you something, Jim? 
If our church has been blessed, it's not because of our programs. It was God's grace. God did it. And I have learned, folks, if it's going to get done at all, it's got to be done by the grace of God. First time I ever met pastor was here. And we came down, I brought my church staff down and we visited and we had lunch together. And uh, my, my church staff left the room. We were up in the conference room and I just had a little time. First time I ever met pastor. And you know, I was an older guy, I'm, I'm older, I, I'm not much, but I'm a little bit older, you know. But I was definitely impressed of what the Lord did. And I thought, you know what? It's my little chance here. I'm gonna ask this guy, I may never talk to him again in my life. So I'm gonna ask him. I said, hey pastor, you have any advice for me? I, I kind of meant it a little bit in California and pastoring or, or, or anything like that. Or, and then I kind of asked him, I said, you know, what would you say that God has done here and why God did it? And I'll never forget two things he said. Number one, he said to me, he said, Brother Shetler, when I came to Lancaster, I did not come to Lancaster to pastor Lancaster Baptist Church. I came to Lancaster to Pastor Lancaster, the city. And I'm telling you, there is, that is a jewel of a truth. I believe that was true when I went to Santa Maria. I believe, I, I thought the same thing. When he said that, I just resonated with them because I think that is, and that's why this church has had such an impact in its community. But another thing he did say, and I said, you know, he said, you know, Brother Shuttler, just stay humble and let God's grace do it. And I, guys, I will tell you, if there's anything that comes out of anyone's life, it isn't because, well, we did this, we did this, we did this, and of course we did this, and it's it. No, it's the grace of God. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that grace today. First of all, what is God's grace? I love definitions. I don't know of a word that is harder to define, and I don't think I really define it that well today, but I am going to give you a little description of it, okay? God's grace, number one, what is God's grace? God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for our need. You know what amazes me? I don't know how many people that are in this room right now, but however many people there are in this room, that's how many needs there are. Every one of us have individual needs. Some of us are in health, some of us, we can put them under categories, finances, health, relational. But the fact of the matter is, we all have need in this room. The person next to you is a needy person. By the way, think about that when you leave. That you don't just come into church and walk out of church and, and never talk to anybody, because everybody has needs. And, we, and, and His grace is sufficient for our need. Number two, it's sufficient for our want. Whatever you want, God's grace is sufficient for that. It's sufficient for our sin. It's sufficient for our ministry. It's sufficient for our family. And it's sufficient for our lives. God's grace never runs down. God's grace never runs low. God's grace never runs dry. God's grace never runs out. God's grace is perfect. God's grace is precise. God's grace is prompt. Have you not noticed that? How God's grace just shows up right when we need it. And it's exactly what we need and it's always in plenty. God's grace will always be unmerited. It will always be undeserved, but it will always be enough. God's grace is sufficient. Number two, God's grace is strong. Boy, I am thankful for the strength of God's grace. We were we just read something, uh, Pastor read uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 in uh, uh, the, the Sunday school hour with the, with the connection group leaders. And uh, that be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, because God's grace is strong. Look at Romans chapter 5. Wow, this is powerful on the strength of God's grace. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, that would be Adam, many were made sinners, all of us. So by the obedience of one, that would be Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. And look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, 
grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so must grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Grace is strong. It's not only sufficient, but it's strong. Matter of fact, if I had to give a definition, this is what I put down for grace. God's ability given for our good to do what's right. God's ability, his favor that he gives to us for our good so we can do what's right in salvation. If God doesn't give you grace, you will never do the right thing for salvation. You got to have the grace of God. When I was a college student, I got to hear a message from a preacher. His name was Dr. Lester Roloff. And he had this famous message called Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And it's really cool how he tells the story. You got to know, you got you to know this guy and, and the, just the type of guy he was. But he, he was just quite the guy. And, and so Dr. Lester uh, Roloff, Dr., Dr. Roloff comes into the doctor's office and he says, he comes to sees Dr. Law. And he sits down in the doctor's office as he's preaching, you know, and he says, Dr. Law, I got a problem. My hands. My hands. My hands do things they ought not to do. Dr. Law, Dr. Law, I need to get a surgery done on my hands because they're doing things that, they're, that they shouldn't be doing. Dr. Law says, Lester, your problem isn't your hands. No, no, no. Dr. Law, let me tell you, my problem is my eyes. I'm looking at things I shouldn't be looking at. Can you give me an eye transplant? I got to get new eyes because my eyes. And Dr. Law says, Lester, your problem is not your eyes. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. You got to give me a new tongue. My problem is my tongue. I'm saying things I ought not to say. Can you, Dr. Law, can you give me surgery and can you give me a new tongue? Lester, your problem's not your tongue. Let me tell you something, Dr. Law. You gotta give me some new feet because my feet are going places they ought not to go. I got a problem with my feet. Can you just give me some new feet so I start going in the right places? Dr. Law says, your problem's not your feet, Lester. Well, Lester Roloff gets upset. He said, boy, Dr. Law, you're not listening to me. You're not helping me at all. So he leaves Dr. Law and he goes to Dr. Be good, do good, look good. And Dr. Be good, do good, look good doesn't give him anything. He goes to see Dr. Religion. And boy, he visits Dr. Religion, and Dr. Religion tells him all the things he's got to do, and it did him, and it didn't make any difference. So he says, okay, I'm going back to Dr. Law. So he goes back to Dr. Law, and he says, Dr. Law, I've tried Dr. Religion and Dr. Be good, do good, and look good, and none of them can help me. Dr. Law, I'm ready. You tell me what I need, and, and I'll do whatever you say. And Dr. Law says, Lester, you need a new heart. I need a new heart. He says, yeah, you need a new heart. Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Roloff says to him, he says, all right, Dr. Law, do the surgery. Give me a new heart. I love this part. Dr. Law says, can't do it. Can't do it. Dr. Law! You told me it wasn't my hands. It's not your hands. You told me it wasn't my eyes. You told me it wasn't my tongue or my feet. It's not. You told me I need a new heart. You do? Well, Dr. Law, perform it. He says, I can't. I don't do that surgery. But I know a doctor who can. You want to go to him? Dr. Roloff says, yeah. Take me to him. Come on down here. And they go out to Dr. Law's office, and they walk down the hallway, and they come to a doctor. Dr. Grace. And Dr. Grace does a surgery on him. And Dr. Grace takes out the heart and puts a new heart in. And Dr. Grace does this incredible surgery. And afterwards, Lester says, man, I'm a new man. Man, I'm telling you, this is unbelievable. But he said, I got to tell you, Dr. Grace, I don't have any money to pay for this surgery. Dr. Grace says it's already been paid for. He said, the surgery's already been paid for. Dr. Grace said, it has. Would you like to meet the person who paid for your surgery? He said, I would. He took me in an office, and there was Jesus. And Jesus paid for the surgery that Dr. Grace gave me a new heart. Hey, let me tell you something, folks. 
God's grace is strong. God's grace can change your life. No matter what you've been, you could try a bunch of religion. You can go to other churches in Antelope Valley, and they can tell you you got to do this and you got to do this. You got to get baptized. You got to give. You got to do this. But I'm telling you, it won't be a change. You got to get to Dr. Grace. And Jesus Christ paid for that salvation. And I listen, God's grace is strong. However, as strong as God's grace is, it's not irresistible. As strong as God's grace is, it's not irresistible. What do you mean, Brother Shuttler? This is an amazing thing about grace. It is powerful. It is strong. But you can say no to it. It amazes me. Haven't you spoken to people at the door? I've spoken to people at the door. I've spoken to people at an airport, on, a, on an airplane. I've spoken to people at restaurants where they've come right to the point where grace could save them. And you know what they did with it? They rejected it. They resisted it. Grace is not irresistible, my friend. Grace can be said no to. It is strong. Grace is powerful. But grace can be resisted. Hey, I want to encourage you. Don't resist the grace of God, man. Say yes to God's grace today. Don't say, well, I don't, I don't know. No, it is sufficient for whatever you're going through. It is strong. And number three, God's grace is specific. I just love this point. God's grace is specific for the task. And God's grace is specific for the time. You say, Brother Shelley, what do you mean by this? First of all, there's all kinds of different grace. Whatever you need, the grace is there. There's financial grace. There is, there is healing grace. There is dying grace. Whoa. I have been with people just before they passed away. And it's like, whoa, they've got so much peace on them. You know what that is? That's a dying grace, the ability to do what is right at that moment. There, whatever situation you have, there's, there's wisdom grace, there's counseling grace, there's friendship grace, there's reconciling grace. There is grace for every task that you have. Because my friend, you can't do anything without God's grace. So whatever the need is, there is grace for that task. There is an ability to do what is right in that situation. God will give you the grace for the task. But number two, his grace is specific for its timing. Hey, I gotta tell you this. There's two things about grace that's really cool. Grace is limited. Oh, Brother Shetler, you can't limit grace. Yeah, you can. Let me tell you what it's limited by. It's limited by yesterday, and it's limited by tomorrow. See, Brother Sean, I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about. God only gives grace for the moment. God does not give you grace for yesterday. And God does not give you grace. You've got to hear this. God does not give you grace for tomorrow. The only grace you get is for now. And if you don't accept the grace for now, you miss it. There are people in this room, you worry. You are so caught up with fears and you are worrying so much. God hasn't given you grace for it yet. It hasn't happened yet. You're not there yet. And you're so worried and you're so freaking out. And there's so much stress in your life. And God's going, hey. We're not there yet. All right, let me give you a verse because some of you are looking like, I, I don't know, understand what you're talking about. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Listen to this. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, God will give you the grace for that moment when it comes. But some of you are just like, oh, I've got this coming down the right. And God hasn't given you grace for it yet. Grace is specific for the task. 
And grace is specific for the time. And God's only grace isn't for yesterday. And folks, God's grace is not for tomorrow. God's grace is only for now in what you need. Number two, number two. I like this grace stuff, Brother Shelley. It's sufficient, it's strong, and it's specific. Well, how do I get it? So this is the most important part of the message. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you. Again, maybe you know these verses, but it's just so good to look at them when you're, when you're in the Bible. Take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4. Man, what a passage. James chapter 4, and it says, and it's just what we need. James chapter 4. And the Bible says, hold on. James 4. In verse number six, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. Man, I mean, he goes against them. That's his enemy, those that are proud. But giveth grace unto the, everyone together, the humble. So let me give you the grace formula. And it's pretty simple, but it will work. Here's the grace formula. Honesty plus helplessness equals humility. Honesty plus helplessness equals humility. And then humility will produce the grace. This is a pretty simple formula, folks. Get honest. And when you get honest, and by the way, you know what humility is? The right view of yourself. Humility is the right view of you. So when you get the right view of you, you realize, oh boy, I'm a needy person. You are. Some of you do not have the right view of yourself. Some of you are full of yourself. Some of you think you do this and you do that and you've been doing this for so long and some of you have been having a bus route for a long time or you've done this or you've done that or you've served the Lord so long. You could just kind of do, hey, I'm coming into another year, school year. Oh man, I got that. I've been teaching Christian school now for 20 years or whatever. Whoa, let's get honest about ourselves and where we are. And when we become transparent and we get honest, man, I'll tell you, that translate into helplessness. God, I can't do this. Brother Shuttler, how long have you been doing Joshua camps? 10 years. And you got a director now. You don't do nearly as much stuff. No, I don't. No, I don't. That Brother Smithy, he's doing the whole thing now, isn't he? He is. He is. Are you overwhelmed to do leadership camp tomorrow? Absolutely more than anyone in this room would understand. I'm absolutely like, God, what's got to happen in leadership camp cannot be done by Jim Shetler. And I want to tell you, this is so cool. In my entire life, in my entire ministry, I have never been called to do anything that I could do. I never have. And this guy put me in all kinds of positions that I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> and there were, there were times I was frustrated. I am so sick and tired of the ox being in the ditch. But do you know what? I saw God in those ditches. Amen. I did, Pastor. I saw God in those ditches because I go, God, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. God, I can't, I'm not equipped for this. I know. And God's will will never be what you can do. God's will will always be where his grace will be sufficient. And you trust God. And some of you, I'm this is an incredible formula. It's so simple of a formula. Honesty plus helplessness equals humility. And as soon as you get that humility, God's grace is coming. Humility is the right view of you. Number three and we're done. Brother Shuttle, I, I, I think I understand a little bit about this God's ability to do what I'm supposed to do. And I, and I understand how to get God's grace. By the way, that is the most important passage. And number three, Brother Shaw, can I ask, why does God give grace? Why does he give us this grace? Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. So why does God give grace, Brother Shetler? Two reasons. His glory and your good. He gives grace to get glory. Now listen to that passage. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should, everyone together, lest any man should boast. Okay, so one day, they're going to do the roll call up in heaven. And that roll call, they're going to bring out the book of life, and they're going to bring out, and they're going to give the roll call up in heaven. I don't know who gets to do it, but someone's going to be reading the names. Abraham! Whoa. Man, Father Abraham had many sons. There he is. Abraham, the father of our faith, spiritually. Man, there he is. Abraham. We knew Abraham. Well, of course, Abraham. Matter of fact, when people died in the Old Testament, they went to Abraham's bosom. Man, we know Abraham's going to be up in heaven. Yeah, there he is. Abraham. Moses. Whoa. Mo, I wonder if he got to bring his rod, you know, I don't Yeah, Moses, man, we know Mo, the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. Moses, he's going to be in heaven, man. Roll call's given. Moses, where he is. Way to go, Moses. You're the best. What a deliverer. David, whoa, man after God's own heart. There he is. Boy, what a king. Way to go, David. Man, you were great, that Goliath thing, wow. David, we know David's going to be in heaven. Apostle Paul. Whoa, greatest Christian ever lived. There he is. Wow, you wrote a lot, man. I'm, you're, man, what a guy. We know who Apostle Paul's going to be in heaven. Jim Shetler. Shetler made it? Shetler's here? Jim Shetler. Yeah, Lancaster Baptist, let me tell you something. And I get to go to heaven for the same reason Abraham, Moses, David, and Paul do. That's right. The grace of God. And I want to just tell you something, friend. God's grace brings glory to him because... God knows how bad you are. He does. God knows what Shetler has thought, said, and done. You guys don't. God knows. And God still saved me by his grace. And that is to the glory of God. That is to God's glory. Nobody will be in heaven to boast, well, you know, I did have the best bus route Lancaster Baptist has ever had. That is not what you're going to heaven for and by. It is God's grace. And that is amazing. Some of you don't quite get it, so let me show it to you. His glory are good. So sometimes we're at home, and my, my wife, she's smarter than me, definitely better looking than me. My wife just got it together, and I don't. Okay, so there's very few things in life that I can do that Marilee can't do. I mean, just about anything Marilee can do better than I can do. But every once in a while, something happens at the Shetler home. Jim! Jim! Yeah, Marilee, what? I'm, I'm watching something. I'm trying to watch the game. Jim, can you come here and help me? Early, what do you need? You can do everything. What do you need? I can't open the pickle jar. <laughs> I said, Marilee, you can't open the... Jim, oh, here I go. So I get up. Now, I'm loving every minute of this, you know, because I can do something she can't do. And I get in the kitchen, and I go, what you got? She said, Jim, I have tried. I got these grip things. They didn't work. I've tried everything, and I can't open it. Oh, what do you do when I'm not here, Marilee? Well, I don't have any pickles, okay? But here, I, I, I can't open it. Oh, Marilee. 
there you go, babe. <laughs> and I go back, sit down, and she says, thanks, Jim. You're so strong. I know. <laughs> thanks a lot. I couldn't do it without you. I know, I know. <laughs> and I go sit back down, and I go like, yeah. I do not at all want to demean my God, but I am telling you something. Lord, I'm in a pickle. God, I can't. God says, hey, here you go, Jim. I got it. What does that do? That brings glory to God. My friend, you get on your knees and you say, God, I am helpless. God, I cannot make this happen in my life. God, I have struggled with anger. I have struggled with lust. I have struggled with worry. I have all my life been defeated in this area. And God says, give it to me. I will help you. I will open it for you. I will give you the grace you need, the ability. I will enable you. I will favor you. I will give you what you need. You're going to trust me by faith. You're going to take your step, and I will open it for you. Come to me, helpless. Man, Paul says, Lord, would you take this thorn away? No, 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 no. No, no, you don't need the thorn taken away. What you need is my grace to be sufficient. Lord, could you just take this one thing off my plate? No, no, you don't need that thing taken off your plate. You need my grace to do it. Will you, Lord, this is beyond me. Good, now give it to me. Come to me helpless and say, God, I don't know how to parent. I don't know how to do this marriage thing. I don't know how to do this. And God, I need your grace. Hey, so why is your marriage so good? Well, we, uh, we have a date night once a week. We resolve our problems. Jim, if our marriage is good, it's because of the grace of God. How many times have I sat in a marital counseling situation, two proud people that both have the wrong view of themselves, just going at each other. And as a pastor, you just go like, oh, Lord, they're going to ruin their whole lives, their children, and their marriage if one of them would just humble themselves, if one of them would just say, will you forgive me? I did wrong. Just humble yourself. And then the grace pipeline opens up. Man, I saw a young man uh, the Friday night at camp. He did not make one decision. I'm telling you, every kid in that camp made a decision, except for this one guy. Friday night, he just finally broke. And he humbled himself, and he said, God, I need you. And he surrendered. I think he was saved already, but he surrendered his life to God. And he just, and he had so much joy. God was going like, will you give it to me? I will do it. Oh, and my life is so terrible. Give it to God. My grace is sufficient. I'll take care of it for you. 